Michaela de Prince, The War Orphan Who Became a Ballerina, by William Creamer, magazine article. Background. From 1991 to 2002, Sierra Leone went through a violent civil war. During this decade, life in Sierra Leone was extremely dangerous due to a near-complete lack of law in the country. Tens of thousands of people lost their lives, and countless families were torn apart. Children who lost their parents during the war became known as war orphans. About the author. William Creamer is a feature writer at the British Broadcasting Corporation, BBC, a major radio, television, and media company. Michaela de Prince, The War Orphan Who Became a Ballerina, by William Creamer. A professional stage debut is a huge event in the life of any ballerina, but Michaela de Prince's recent tour of South Africa also marked the end of an extraordinary journey from her childhood as a war orphan in Sierra Leone. I got out of a terrible place, says de Prince. I had no idea I would be here. I'm living my dream every single day. She was born in Sierra Leone in 1995. Her parents named her Mabinti, but after they both died during the Civil War, she was sent to an orphanage where she became a number. They named us from 1 to 27, she recalls. 1 was the favorite child of the orphanage, and 27 was the least favorite. De Prince was number 27 because she suffers from vitiligo, a condition in which patches of skin lose pigmentation. To the aunties who ran the orphanage, it was evidence of the evil spirit within the three-year-old. She still recalls the fierce antagonism of the women. They thought of me as a devil's child. They told me every day how I wasn't going to get adopted, because nobody would want a devil's child, she says. Although the other girls in the orphanage were encouraged not to play with her, De Prince formed a close friendship with child number 26, also called Mabinti, who was disliked by the aunties because she was left-handed. The pair shared a sleeping mat. At night, when Michaela had bad dreams, her mat mate would soothe her with kind words and stories. Her memories of early childhood are fragmentary, moments of piercing clarity which have been reassembled in date order. She believes it was soon after witnessing the killing of her teacher that she stumbled upon something that was to shape the rest of her life, a discarded magazine. There was a lady on it. She was on her tippy toes in this pink, beautiful tutu. I had never seen anything like this. A costume that stuck out with glitter on it, with just so much beauty. I could just see the beauty in that person and the hope and the love and just everything that I didn't have. And I just thought, wow, this is what I want to be. De Prince ripped the photograph out of the magazine and, for the lack of anywhere else to keep it, stuffed the treasured scrap in her underwear. One day, the orphanage was warned it would be bombed, and the children there were marched to a distant refugee camp. Here, De Prince learned that her beloved madmate was to be adopted. An American woman, Elaine De Prince, had come to the camp to adopt child number 26, now called Mia. For a moment, Michaela was distraught because she believed that all the other children would be taken to new homes and she would be left behind. But abruptly, there was a change of plan. When the aunties told Elaine de Prince that Michaela was unlikely to find another home, she decided to adopt both girls. Michaela remembers struggling to understand what was happening. She was intoxicated by the American woman with her dazzling blonde hair, but there was something else on her mind, too. I was looking at people's feet because I thought, everyone has to have ballet point shoes. They have to have point shoes because these are people from the U.S. Not only was Elaine not wearing any point shoes, but as Michaela found when she looked through her suitcase that night, she had none in her luggage either. Her new mother quickly noticed Michaela's obsession with ballet. We found a Nutcracker video, and I watched it 150 times, Michaela says. When they finally went to see a stage performance, she was able to point out to her mother the places where dancers had missed their steps. Elaine enrolled five-year-old Michaela in the Rock School of Dance in Philadelphia, making the 45-minute drive from New Jersey every day. 
But de Prince remained a shy girl, painfully self-conscious of her vitiligo. That was all I would think about when I was on stage. I had trouble looking at myself in the mirror, she says. Instead of glorying in the glittery tutus and bodices that had drawn her to ballet, she covered herself up whenever possible with turtleneck sweaters. One day, the prince asked one of her ballet teachers if she thought her skin condition might hold back her career. The teacher asked her what she was talking about. She hadn't even noticed the pale patches on her skin. She'd just been watching her steps. That was a significant moment for her. But, she says, being a black ballet dancer is hard, even in the U.S. She thinks the problem is that in the corps de ballet, the group of ballerinas who are not soloists, girls are supposed to look the same. It is a challenge, she says. If you look at ballet companies, you won't really see any black girls. You might see a mixed-race girl, but there are only one or two black soloists in the whole U.S. Now 17, De Prince recently completed a tour with the Dance Theater of Harlem, many of whose dancers are African-American or mixed-race. I have become more upbeat. I used to be very shy, she says. Now I've grown up, and I'm so happy with the way things are turning out.